we have Neil, the King's Life Digital Lab, and um, using 2D and 3D. Okay. Uh, typically, <laughs> I, I've realised I can't see my notes, so I'm, I'm going to have to wing it a little bit. Um, yeah, Neil Jackman, King's Digital Lab, um, senior research software analyst there. Um, if you want to follow our work, that's the the Twitter thing. Um, closing in on 3,000 followers, so like and subscribe and all that. Um, uh, this, so yeah, the staffy title: using 2D and 3D digital tools. Um, to for a fresh perspective on a well-known artwork, but it just rolls off the tongue. Um, the so back this uh, the well-known artwork in question is this picture uh, by Titian. So this is uh, Diana and Action, uh, which is uh, owned by the National Gallery in London um, and the National Galleries of Scotland. It kind of swaps around, um, and it's a painting uh, of uh, by Titian, one of seven. God, I really could do with those notes right now. I <laughs> um, that's OK, we'll be OK. Um, no, no, that's fine. Um, the, uh, it, it, if you may know this painting, it's a, it's a picture from, um, inspired by Ovid's, one of the, a story from Ovid's Metamorphoses. And what we see is, is the hunter Action coming upon um, the entourage of the Diana the Huntress in the forest um, and sort of transgressing into that space and for his uh, pains he gets he gets cursed turned into a stag and then torn to shreds by his own hounds so that's what happens there um so these seven pictures had come together to the national gallery late uh, late or early 2020 sorry for the first time in 500 years they brought these pictures together and then almost immediately uh, the covid lockdown happened right so no one was going to get to see these no one was actually good. There's a good chance that no one's going to get to see this exhibition, um, which I think was called Love, Death and Desire or something like that. Um, so KCL was at that time in a, a kind of research partnership with the National Gallery um, called NGX, um, National Gallery X, um, where we were looking at ways to leverage new technology um, to innovate and create impact in, in the glam sector and as part of that program there were a number of residence, residencies and one of these residencies um, was 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 taken up by, by a company called Playlines um, and the, the owner of Playlines is Rob Morgan who's, who's quite a, a close associate of the, of the lab and he had to pivot very quickly um, from his original concept of that residency to um, so the, this kind of uh, he had hoped to do an on-site um, uh, experiment in, in this particular area that they, that they set aside. Um, but quickly what he decided to do instead was work towards creating this digital framework for presenting um, uh, a piece of work uh, which used the ubiquity of AR capabilities in people's devices so that they could bring that painting into their homes or into their gardens in this case, put it on the wall. You know, so far so so normal. Um, but what Rob's extra vision was, was that uh, in addition to just having that painting there, he wanted to demonstrate that there was a kind of breadth of different curatorial uh, voices and experiences and opinions about this work and at any given time the person using the app could jump from one curatorial um, viewpoint to another. Um, and so it just so happened in one of the first early meetings, we were talking about how we could fold KCL expertise into this into this project. And it so happened I'd kind of personally been working up with another work in the in the National Gallery's collection, which has been seen as St. Jerome and his study. And what I've been trying to do with this picture, um, so the simple one point perspective and these sharp architectural lines um, encourage me to experiment with the idea of trying to turn this image into a 3D representation of the same image, partly because if you look at it, I mean, you, there's a slight sense of, of, of what's happening spatially isn't entirely plausible, but it's, uh, and I thought that there might be something in 
just the very act of, of, of converting this thing from 2D into 3D that would give some insight into how those elements were placed. Um, and it would just be an interesting thing to do. And so the suggestion was that I try to do this with the Titian painting as well. Um, so it was too late to do that, to fold that into the app that Rob had, had created. But what we ended up contributing to that project was um, a recorded conversation between myself and the artist Tom DeFreston about the relative merits of this as an approach and what kind of insights he as, as, as an art historian could, could gain from, from looking at this painting in a new way. Um, so the kind of the, 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 the whole process that underpins this conversion, if you like, uh, the, the starting point is uh, using this piece of software, um, which is essentially the plugin for Blender. Um, it's called FSpy. Um, and what we do is we work out parallel converging lines of um, towards vanishing points, use, uh, given the visual cues we can see in the image. And by doing that, we can essentially solve for where the camera or the viewer in this case would be. It's normally a piece of software that you use, use with a photo. Um, so using information from the from the different vanishing points, we can say, OK, the camera is here and this will make a camera set up for me, which I can then bring into the 3D software blender and it sets up my perspective and then it's up to me to start creating the geometry um, that would that would uh, that matches uh, the painting. So um, I think before we get into more about the methodology, there's a, a quick video. I'm not sure if this is playing straight away. So very quick. Um, I didn't again, I didn't have long to work on this. It was purely a personal like a, a passion project. Really, there, was, there wasn't really any money to do with this. Um, and I wasn't really I, one of the things I didn't like about the way I approached this project is there was far too much for me interpretation. Um, and subjectivity in what I was doing here. I spent far too long making the, the characters detailed. I spent far too long doing things which which weren't really adding to the to the, to the research question. Um, my key finding at that time that I thought was interesting was I can make the perspective work without truncating this poor nymph's legs into the back of this plinth. Um, um, and, and we had this conversation, Tom and I, about how that was, uh, that was, uh, you know, it, it kind of underlined that this was a completely invented space, no matter how sort of satisfying it might be. Uh, and, and intuitively, we, we kind of understand that space. Um, but also what I found interesting is as we kind of float around, is how much we fill in as the viewer, how much is left to the imagination, because actually the frame of this picture is very narrow. It's pretty much a square in its aspect ratio. We'll fade in the borders again now. And as soon as you kind of move out of that, that, that framing, the whole scene kind of breaks down, it falls apart and it, you really can't avoid um, make, making sort of quite big interpretive leaps. So I thought let's come back to this project three years later and just see if it can be done a little bit better, a little less concerned um, about the output and what it looks like, um, which kind of sat in what I thought was an uncomfortable area between this kind of schematic um, exploration of composition and light and a kind of pudgy rendered um, sort of uh, 3D sculpt. Um, so <laughs> taking that completely back to basics, I went to, uh, I thought, how did we make this like completely uh, systematic from the outset? I'm not even going to look at this painting and and and, and, um, and interpret it. I thought I'd, I'd, I'd AI has happened, right? I don't need to do that anymore. So <laughs> I, asked, I asked a couple of AIs, and we've got um, escape. One AI told us, so I'll just come out and I'll read it. A painting of a group of naked men and women in a wooded area with a man holding a red cloth, Domenichino, Renaissance oil painting, a Flemish Baroque mannerism. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Let's see, this is from the, uh, the, the OpenAI's clip tagging library. Um, but interestingly, if you use a different tagging library, this is from this one's, the second one was trained on a lot of manga and anime, and I'll read that out to you just for comedy value. Barefoot, blonde hair, 
breasts, brown hair, fine art parody, medium breasts, multiple <laughs> boys, multiple girls, new painting, medium penis, realistic traditional medium. Okay, so we've got a very, clear, very different sort of, uh, but totally um, systematic um, interpretations. Um, and so that second description is, 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 you know, it's borderline pornographic, which is interesting because, but we'll come back to that point a little bit later in the presentation because you won't be surprised to learn that uh, Titian had, over the years, or the work of Titian has been um, interpreted as, as pornographic in some in some circles. Okay, 2D stuff first. Just getting that image into into uh, a piece of Affinity Photo, uh, Affinity Photo is a, an image editing software. Just gave you the luxury of just zooming around, looking at the detail. Some of that detail is really obvious, and some of it's less obvious. Um, so I marked up a few things. We got you know that really passionate, uh, vengeful look that Diana is giving Action from across the water. Um, you've got um, her tiny little dog instantly telling the the audience or the viewer that. Action's presence is uh, is not wanted. There's all these little bits of port, um, lots of symbol symbolism scattered all over the place. So you've got the skull uh, in number three. You've got the skull of a stag up on up on that ruin. Um, uh, in number four, you can just about make out. I think that there is the skins hanging from the uh, from the trees. Um, and then there were little things I thought were interesting. So number five. There's one of the one of the nymphs is kind of she's got her head coming out from one side of the pillar and her hand is hooked around the other side of the pillar um, and I might just be able to make it out but it seems that at some point Titian had kind of repositioned that hand moved it down it got to the trouble of making a very sort of quite minor change but hadn't got to the trouble of rubbing out his his previous work um, and then in Number six, what you can maybe again just about see, which is quite common in these sorts of narrative images, is you've got the whole story. So you've got the you've got the before, uh, um, uh, the middle, and, and, and the end. And what you can see there is is Diana in the hunt, with that little white streak there, chasing chasing a stag in the distance. Um, but what really caught my eye from this point of view of this project was what is going on with the water, and. I was looking at the wall. I think it doesn't doesn't look right. It looked like it looked like it was on a tilt. And I thought, what what visual cues are there to sort of um, confirm that it is on a tilt? And of course, this is the painting as it should hang. And this reflection, this rag, which is hanging down from um, which is being used to dry Diana's feet, has this odd. Well, it's it's clearly not vertical. It's clearly not perpendicular. Um, and if you correct the water for that. Suddenly, so, so that reflection is now hanging down. You have to rotate the painting um, about 16 degrees to get it to, to get the water to sit level. And instantly the whole painting is thrown off balance. The ruin in the background looks like it's about to fall over and the plausibility is instantly kind of thrown into question of, of this space. Um, another like thing I really like is that that plinth has now leveled out. Um, and the reason I point that out is because one of the interpretations that I've read of this painting is that, or elements of this, is that that plinth is bowing essentially under the weight of the power and the presence of the, of the nymphs whose kind of presence belies their kind of harmless, harmless appearance. But, you know, give the painting a little tilt and it, and it all just makes sense again. Okay. Um, Compositional conventions. OK, we're still in the 2D world at the moment. I thought let's just overlay some some typical grids, which um, which we normally yeah, they might be used in photography or art. If I put a thirds grid over the over the image, I don't see any particular correlation with the composition. Similarly, if I use some diagonals, maybe you could arguably say there's something happening with the faces. Um, but it wasn't until I switched over to the golden spiral uh, compositional tool or the logarithmic spiral um, that for me and it might be me reading a little bit into this it really seems to match the flow of the shapes and the composition um, I'm, I, I really leads the eye for me from the uh, from the bottom right round and then coming back to that point about pornography or, or pornographic reading of this painting 
it rather suggestively ends up that that spiral just culminates on, on, one, on that reclining nymph. Um, a quick word about colour. So you'd look at this, I think most people looking at this painting was, uh, glancing at this painting, would think there's, there's, there's these two obvious big swashes of colour, the, 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 the red beneath Diana and the red curtain that's kind of dividing Action from the scene afterwards. Um, and those are very dominant and they're very, they're clearly quite symbolic and significant. Um, but if we do a, a quick sort of statistical bucket of, of how the colour is used in this painting, if I look at the top five hues, which you can see over there, it's actually pretty, it's just variations on brown and mud and, and dark. If we add in 10 colours, we start to get a, a kind of dark blue emerging. And it's not until I, I um, bring in uh, 15 different colours based on this palette, on the palette generated from this um, painting that we actually start to see the reds. That's not, you know, it's not telling me anything particularly new, but as a, as a, as a layman, I think it's interesting that that's something, you know, a, a, an element that's so important in the composition and that brings so much impact to the, or striking impact to the composition, is actually achieved with, with very little in terms of, of the use of colour. Okay, F spy. We, I, I talked again about how to, um, uh, about identifying the, these convergent lines. So this, um, this process that I went through is probably something that only really works with where, where you have um, sufficient parallel lines that maybe not wouldn't work so well in organic or completely organic images, and, and certainly not in, in abstract images, of course. Um, uh, the other thing I just I, I wanted to note from finding on on FSPI was that I could also I don't once I'd solved for that perspective it was clear that the horizontal line from the viewer's point goes straight through uh, the eye line of Diana. So again, you're being placed or, or you've got a, an awareness of where you're being placed as the viewer in this image of what you're being who you're being led to identify identify with. Okay. Technical stuff. So I got into this is one of the things I, I wasn't happy with the last time. You know, we talked about the nymph and her cut off legs. Um, so this time I wanted to take a bit more of a, a systematic approach to trying to get these characters in, 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 in the right um, at the right depth, the right apparent distance. Um, and so I made this assumption. Um, I googled the average male height, 177 centimeters. Average female, 163 centimeters. I reused that as a standard throughout all the all the figures um, and it's not that much of a leap because in all likelihood um, most of the female models here were probably the same Every, each of these female figures is probably the same model just rendered in different poses um, but yeah knowing that um, I brought the image into quantum GIS I registered it in a sort of Cartesian space so it wasn't distorted by any map projection and I equated a pixel to a meter and using that I could work out um, the height in pixels if you like of these characters and then work back to work out how big a centimeter was or how, you know, or how many pixels was, were needed to, um, to represent a virtual centimeter at different depths and then we made this kind of big leap about it's all with reference from where Action is standing um, which I calculated about 6.6 .6 meters and again it's quite presumptuous. It's based on um, knowing that the a 50 millimeter lens is equivalent roughly to the human eye in, in the way it, um, it renders depth. That's why the photographers call it a nifty 50. OK, but another approach, another AI approach, I was thinking about how we could, how I could again be a bit more, a, a bit systematic about depth and I use stability um, AI or stable diffusion and I generated some depth maps. So dark areas are distant, light areas are, are closer. Um, again, there are different approaches. This is Zoe uh, depth calculation, which is kind of held to be, I think, like real world reliable um, or more reliable than the method, this is the Lerez method, which gives us quite a detailed um, depth map 
but what you tend to find is, is, is that there's far too much ends up right at the front of the image. But even just taking that, those depth maps, combining them with the original image, we can get a sort of crude um, 3D um, interpretations, which you are seeing there. OK, but I then used another few AI models just to see what else we could we could play with. Uh, one of the things was pose analysis. So um, uh, stable diffusion was able to look at this and, and, and spit out how the how the characters were were standing so I could standardize that. Um, soft edges in the painting, normal maps. So again, it's again, it was like a, a, a bit of a visual help in in uh, in trying to in, in interpret the painting. Um, not of particular use, but this was an automatic segmentation of the image. So um, red being human characters, blue being animals and so on and so forth. OK, um, so as I said, I, I, I knew I'd got really overly hung up on details and making people be voluptuous or have the right hairstyles or or the right clothes and I thought I'm not going to bother with that so I'm going to strip all the figures back to basics because what it's about at the end of the day is just uh, light and composition and, and, and what that can tell us um, but trying to pose a character in in, in 3D on a, in a 2D space is actually pretty difficult so um, this is uh, my lovely assistant Kirsty demonstrating using gravity sketch to use mannequins in a scene that I'd exported from Blender with the original painting behind her as reference and she's manipulating um, the mannequins in a very kind of intuitive and tactile way which you could then export back into the original scene. Um, and the last thing again about composition, I think that this is what we ended up with the second time around. Um, is I wanted I wanted the light. I wanted to find out where the light was coming from, who it's focused on, um, and in order to achieve that sort of diffuse light quality, um, I used a, a, a large area light, and I, it was trial and error. I just kind of moved it around until it looked right, and the shadows looked as if they were they were in the uh, in the painting, and it should come as no surprise, I suppose, that. It looked right as soon as I angled the light directly at Diana. Um, but it's it's nice to kind of be able to examine those things um, in, in that kind of detail. So here is my sort of stripped, pared back um, version of that video. I'm much happier with this version of it, even though it doesn't look, there's no colour here. It's just I know that what's been done this time has been, you know, you can see I haven't bothered to worry about if someone's foot is missing under a piece of a bit of water. I, it was important that, um, that the, the composition was was roughly was more correct. Um, that nymph no longer has her knees buried in a plinth at the back of the painting. Um, the only materials we've got here are like diffuse uh, on the on the on the the ground and the ruin. We've got some subsurface scattering on the on the people and we've got some reflection on the water surface. So it's just brought it completely back to back to the basics and just looking at the the raw elements of that image, um, which gives me less than a minute just to <laughs> mention all the bits of software that I used. Um, started off the first time around, it was, it was just Blender and FSpy. Um, and this time, I spent a lot more time in Affinity Photo, Gravity Sketch I mentioned, Quantum GIS, the Stability AI, uh, Stable Diffusion, and a little iPad app called Posit, which is also quite helpful in, in getting those in getting those figures um, correctly positioned. Um, and I will need to tidy up my presentation before I get to you <laughs> for dissemination. But yeah. Thank you. 
approach these sorts of problems painting. Um, I haven't had any of those conversations. As I say it's been very much a personal project and I think I sort of questioned the value of it as an approach. Well, what am I doing here really other than just satisfying my own intellectual and creative curiosities? Um, but it wasn't until I spoke to Tom um, who actually kind of convinced me that there was this was kind of a valid approach and, and it was interesting to go in as a as as, as a non-expert, if you like, um, completely uninformed for me and, ju and just explore this painting without any 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 sort of preconceptions of what I was supposed to see or what I was going to see. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to. Well, you're the you're the matchmaker, Jeff. You know, so, <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, if, you, if you think there are there are avenues to do this, but I think hopefully we'll get an opportunity to do that with some of the projects in the lab that are coming up over the next year or so. Um, so I, I we'll be working with some of some artists in residence and, and those sorts of things. Um, so we'll, we'll see if I can if I can take it anywhere. Is there a go you or, I mean, if you're sitting at home and you're interpreting things, you can have a class at home with different people. So spread all over the country or around the world. And so and then you get the feedback from them and then you iterate and improve it. And so it becomes a really beautiful little teaching tool. Especially for like 3D environment students that are modeling and um, you know, creating a scene of people or, or other objects and actually understanding the depth of the, the light source and you know, how the shadows fall and everything else. Yeah. And, and it even does, because it's really important that, that visual impact. Well, one, one thing I only discovered this week, um, and maybe as any people who are well versed in, in, in Renaissance art might know this, but this actually turns out to be a, one of two paintings that are always hung together. The other one is Diana and Callisto, um, and they are joined um, thematically by that, that stream um, into the other painting. And I think Titian had envisaged that they would be hung either side of a window because uh, the, the light comes from different directions in both paintings. Um, so, I mean, and, and all my explorations painting was done in isolation. I, I, I hadn't registered that and it's, it would be interesting to go back again for a third time and, and, and sort of think about, think about the two together. Um, it's, it's quite interesting as well that the colour palette that came up because it wasn't until you went to, I think it was 15 when they said the reds showed up. And yet Titian is known for it's Titian red, you know, that, that right, yeah. is known for Titian red because uh, he uses red in all of his paintings and yet it, it was significantly lower than all the other ones he used. So. Yeah, and I think one of the things, when I first looked, started looking at this painting, I wasn't a particular fan of it. Um, I. Uh, but, but I think I got to know it really intimately, which is what I call like a really close reading of, of the painting. And what I started to appreciate, or had more appreciation for, was the economy of the strokes, the economy of, of, of colour and, and detail, and what was achieved um, through, through, through very small um, differences and, and, and variances. Any other questions? Um, I hadn't really thought um, about it. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. I, as I said, the, 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 the technique, the, the, everything's kind of underpinned. What you see there is based on, you know, it, it's pretty rocky ground, basically. I'm making some assumptions about um, architecture that I can't see. I'm making assumptions about symmetry um, that I can't confirm. And I'm, but I'm using those assumptions to make those convergent lines and therefore place my camera. So, you know, whatever, <coughs> it looks OK to me, but I'm, I'm also very aware that, you know, it, it can't be separated from, from my subjectivity um, and just trying to work out how to be <coughs> completely systematic um, using these sorts of tools, I think would be an interesting uh, Thing to, to to codify and to see if there's a, yeah, a procedure there. Yeah, the way you can kind of get inside the painting and then there's a 
what what springs to mind is um, uh, there's a there's a view from one of the hills outside of Winchester. There's some sort of um, cab drivers in the foreground as they take them into the city. You can see down onto sort of you can see the cathedral and some buildings and yeah. things like that. And I thought, well. Get inside that sort of painting in this, in this way. Well, I suppose if you know the size of the average cow yes. and the size of the <laughs> Winchester <laughs> Cathedral, yes. and you could work out, you know, how high it is in centimetres, then yeah, we could, we could we could play with those kind of ideas. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.